Has Thermal Ruined Roy? Having had the luxury of heat seeking, can Roy learn to love night vision again as he tackles the Ratberg? I'm more scared of a charging <laughs> rat than I am a charging buffalo. Do you see the size of the teeth on it? What rimfire do you shoot? We have the results of our survey, and there is one clear winner in both rifle and ammunition. Can you guess what it is? Claims about raptor persecution regularly hit the headlines and gamekeepers are nearly always blamed in a concerted effort to end grouse shooting. We look at how the raptor persecution people are persecuting gamekeepers. Plus, I am in the Lake District combining English, Inuit and Japanese words for a new kind of fishing. Yep, it's Flyakara. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Roy has a ratberg. It's a dump, a bonfire, a trash heap that grows, gets a bit smelly, Not and bad. then springs into life. Oh, a smack on the money. Yeah, at the top of the five bar gate, yeah? It's been a bountiful year for these special rodents. Roy is constantly chipping away, but maintains that poison is oh, yeah, a no-no. Yeah, yeah, because obviously we've got the birds of prey here and you know we're, we're surrounded by wild owls and wild birds of prey as well so we don't put any poisons down so we don't use any rodenticides because you can get the problems with um, secondary poisoning so most of our rat control is done by shooting with the air rifles and trapping. We've got a new digital night vision that we've, uh, we've put on the FX tonight and obviously I've, I've been using thermal that we can interchange on this and on my centre fires as well. But I've been really keen to see the, the progression of some of the digital night visions that have come along. And this looks like a, an absolutely superb little bit of kit from Pulsar. And this is a Digex N450. I've not tried it at all, we've not even zeroed it yet. So put it on, got it all squared up. So we're gonna do a quick bit of zeroing and then hopefully we can shoot some ratties. So, in best field sports style, we're going to draw ourselves a little rat target on here. And I want to make sure that we're able to hit um, a headshot at 30, 40 yards every time. Um, I'm going to zero about 30 yards. And then for, yeah, for what we're doing tonight, that should be about perfect. So anything from sort of yeah, 15 out to 40 or 50, um, we should be pretty much on the money. So let's have a go at drawing a nice little ratty. No, it's a little bit damp. There we go. And we can do a little tail out the back. There you go. See? Little ratty. Like a finger bob. Like a finger bob. Blimey. Oh no, no actually mouse on the mouse organ. Yeah, there we go. Bag puss. So, now we're going back. Yeah. Didn't have a crosshairs on the middle of his head though. <laughs> this is a very special one. It takes just 10 minutes for Roy to get the Digex zeroed and we are good to go. Okay, so you can see I was just coming down with the adjustments where we're just slightly above and then you can see that hole there so the larger hole we just put three pellets through there so I'm quite happy with that one and I think it is time to go and find some ratties no, not yet the thing is Roy is spoilt he's been using thermal for all his foxing and ratting for a few years now it'll be interesting to see what he thinks of this latest generation of NV I think this is going to be absolutely superb for putting on the centre fires and going out playing with the foxes because that really does look absolutely superb. I'll just play with the IR and just see what that does. Wow. The bonfire is busy and Roy starts making an impression. Yeah, the thermal night vision arguments, there's lots of fors and against. Um, identification is a lot easier with night vision. Um, but if you're using night vision a lot, then the animals do definitely get used to IR illumination. So we've seen that with rats and we've seen that with foxes. Um, but on a, a virgin population of, of rats here with IR, Again, they don't know what it is, um, you know, there's something flashing about, but after two or three nights of doing this, then, you know, the surviving rats would certainly be cute and aware of it. Um, so then we could, we could pop back to thermal, but 
as I say, it's, uh, it really is very, very impressive at the moment using it tonight. And again, I just want to take it out and try it on some boxes yeah. again because I think it's going to work superbly. With the rats right. becoming less enthusiastic to break cover, we look around the rest okay. of the garden. One rat even charges. Well, that's how a tabloid newspaper would describe it. That's coming straight out of school. Oh no, that's about to shoot you quick. I tell you what, I'm more, char I'm more scared of a charging rat than I am a charging buffalo. Do you see the size of the teeth on it? How are you using the FX one tonight? Uh, I think it's chucking out around about 30 foot pounds. So, yeah, for rats it's just absolutely devastating. But for pretty much anything it's absolutely devastating. It's a fantastic little air rifle and so versatile. Charlie now joins us and puts some bait on the bonfire to coax out the rats. He's also got a thermal spotter with him which surprisingly reduces our effectiveness. He's got his head to go back now. Oh, fuck, I'm too zoomed in. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the thing yeah. is, the thermal sees stuff the night vision doesn't. So Charlie ends up directing Roy into targets that are invisible to the NV. No, that was good fun. It's interesting going back to night vision after having used the thermal for so long. Brilliant fun, superb clarity. But when you've got overhanging branches, then you get a lot of reflection on the IR, and the IR is obviously not penetrating underneath, so it's, it can be quite difficult to, to get the images. So as a, an affordable option um, for yeah. bat yeah. shooting and for everything else, I think it's absolutely brilliant, but I won't be giving up my thermal. The image quality of this unit is clear, and when we head out foxing with it, we may have to leave the thermal comfort blanket at home. For more about the Pulsar Digex, go to thomasjacks.co.uk. Thank you, Roy and Charlie. I think that's just the tip of the rat bug. Now from sifting through trash to trash talk and David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Animal rights extremists have sprayed graffiti outside the home of a couple linked to badger culls. The home is also the office of a company that makes tracking devices used by government contracted badger cullers. The antis are demanding the couple cut their contract with the government or they will continue to terrorise them. The night before the graffiti appeared, around 20 sabs stood outside the house chanting slogans, blasting air horns and waking the neighbours. Surrey police is investigating but would not say what stage they're at. A green politician has censored a publicity photograph of himself appearing on Field Sports Channel. Scottish Green MSP Andy Whiteman released a photograph of himself holding an unfledged golden eagle, which we now can't show you, but there is a link to it on Twitter in the description below. We used it in a film last week about bird ringing to highlight how bird ringers are breaking the spirit of rules designed to protect nesting birds. Only one qualified bird ringer and two assistants are allowed to approach a nest. The photographer, copying in Whiteman, asked us to remove the photo on copyright grounds, which we did. In reply, we asked Whiteman if he were part of a larger party at the nest and therefore breaking the law. He hasn't replied. An animal welfare group is blaming a wind turbine after finding an injured white-tailed eagle. The bird was found on moorland on the Isle of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides. It was discovered with a serious head injury and being eaten alive by midges on the 10th of August, according to the Scottish SPCA. A vet's x-ray shows the eagle was severely bruised and had head trauma. The bird's ring showed it hatched on the island in 2009. Energy lobbyist Scottish Renewables insists years would have been spent studying bird populations before planning permission for the wind farm. Organisers of a virtual hound show, which wraps up on Friday, are hailing it a success. Show director Richard Walton says hunts from seven countries are working together, offering incredible shooting, racing and hunting auction lots, while judges and the public have been picking the best registered scent hounds in 30 rings. Bidding in the auctions ends at 11pm GMT on Friday. Walton gave Field Sports News the latest tally for the money raised. We've had people looking, visiting from Pakistan. We've had people from all over Latin America. It's, it's a global phenomenon. An amazing achievement, I think. 
Another country show going online is the Irish Game Fair. The virtualgamefair.com went live at the weekend and showcases Irish sport and retailers following the postponement of the Shane Castles event. It will remain live until the next real life Irish Game Fair in June 2021. Another new website is raising money for grey partridge conservation. Partridge, which stands for Protecting the Area's Resources Through Research, Innovative Demonstration of Good Examples, Catchy, is one of 11 projects approved in 2016 by the Interreg North Sea Region. Interreg Europe helps regional and local governments develop better policies so they can spend the third of a billion euros available each year from the European Regional Development Fund. Backed by the GWCT, which released this video, the website aims to raise awareness about the decline of farmland biodiversity by showing how to increase grey partridge numbers and farmland wildlife at 10 sites in England, Scotland, the Netherlands, Belgium and Germany. Successful grey partridge conservation is seen as a sign of good land management. The grouse painting by Teresa Davis, which Fieldsports Channel auctioned for charity, has reached its owner. Field Sports Channel supporter Helen Stammers bought it for her partner Darren's birthday, raising £450 for a hospice in Bath after an online charity auction backed by Hollywood actress Jamie Lee Curtis rejected the painting for its subject matter. Darren has had his birthday and Helen reports that he's super happy with his new picture. Swedish hunter Jens Ulrich Hoag has accused bird watchers of lying to attack the hunting community. He says the bird watchers are ignoring science and replacing it with lies and warns it is becoming a growing political problem with animal rights groups bending the results of science projects to use in propaganda campaigns. In one case, a group accused Danish hunters of poaching goshawks on a large scale, even though its own experts suggested great horned owls kill and eat goshawks when taking over their nests. The French government has ordered hunters to stop using glue to catch birds. President Emmanuel Macron says hunters in the south have to stop trapping birds by covering twigs with glue, according to the BBC. The move comes after a warning from the European Commission that Macron's government could face legal action over the issue. EU rules allow glue to be used to catch thrushes. The only canton where foreigners can stalk ibex has bowed to animal rights activists. The Valais in southwest Switzerland is to make it harder for foreigners to hunt ibex from 2021. Every hunter, foreign or Swiss, must pass the cantonal hunting examination. In addition, the hunters must obtain at least five hunting licenses for the regular big game hunt for deer, chamois and roe deer. Only when you've qualified, you are allowed to apply for an ibex license. Foreigners also pay a trophy fee based on the length of the ibex's horns. Critics say, as well as money, hunters will have to invest a lot of time. The move comes after a petition against hunting was sparked by a xenophobic documentary on Swiss television in 2019. At least 15 dead pets have washed up on Hong Kong's beaches after police smashed a smuggling ring. The drowned animals have turned up in cages and pet carriers which, say wildlife officials, the smugglers threw overboard. The Hong Kong's SPCA suspects the animals were on their way to mainland China via Hong Kong when they were stolen. It is asking owners whose pets haven't arrived yet to contact police with information about microchip numbers, breeds and ages. Police have made several arrests across the territory. And finally, an American baker has internet users in a tizzy. The groom's cake shows the bride bagging the groom to the caption, the hunt is over. Its baker, Graceful Cake Creations, tells Fox News that hunting is a popular theme for groom's cakes. You are up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. There's more news on our website, link in the description below. Now I have a new word for you, and it's to do with fishing. I am horrified to find that kayak fly fishers are calling their sport flyacking. So here is a sport I'm already calling flyacara. It's tenkara fly fishing from a kayak. 
what's Tenkara? It's a bit of a craze, but it suits the kind of small trout I like to catch. And it's more zen than normal fly fishing. You have a, a wiggly and, crucially, cheap rod. This comes from China and costs £30, no reel. The line, which in my case is a furled leader, is attached to the top of the rod and the cast and fly attached to that. I've put some links to the uh, kit in the description below. The kayak is inflatable and you can carry it in its own rucksack. I'm fishing Seathwaite Tarn in the Lake District today, which you can fish for a £5 donation to Mountain Rescue, payable to the local pub. It's only a mile and a half from the road. Of course, when you come to do it, 30 minutes with this on your back feels like a long walk. The first welcome sight of Seathwaite Tarn is the dam. Setting up is easy. Then the rucksack doubles as a dry bag because you're going to get wet in this kayak. So stuff everything in there and put it in the back of the boat. Then you're fishing. The main difference between this and ordinary fly fishing is that everything has to happen within the length of your rod and your line from you, about three metres in my case. So I have to spend time and be calm getting a position. That's like deciding to shoot rabbits only at exactly 20 yards. The advantages are the price compared to other fishing rods. It's fabulously lightweight. It goes in a pocket and it stops you overreaching yourself with the cast. The disadvantage is that you can't catch big fish. A fish of a pound would give my rod a bit of a, a test. And you have to be careful winding up your line for carrying it, or when you're ready to fish, you get in a tangle. Due to my advancing years, that's why I bought a monocle. Out on the water, fish are rising. I'm making life even more difficult for myself by fishing dry fly, almost dapping it in the wind. And the kayak drifts broadside onto the wind, which is handy. So all you have to do is get upwind of a rising trout, and then it happens. Like the big lakes, many of the Lake District tarns are free to fish. Here's one I caught on Devock Water, the Lake District's largest hill tarn, where the fishing belongs to Millam Anglers. Give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. Well, teach a man fly a cara, he'll probably go hungry, but he will enjoy himself. I enjoyed that. Later in the show, we're looking at how the raptor persecution people are persecuting gamekeepers. Next up, rim fires. There are two big boys in the rimfire rifle market and one massive boy. As you know, we sent out surveys into what kit you use in March 2020. Three and a half thousand replies came back to us. Of those, 613 are responses to our questionnaire about rimfires. And here are the results, starting with most popular make. In third place, it's Ruger with the 1022, the standout choice. In second place, it's Anschutz, where your models of choice are the 1417 and 1517, though neither of those make the top five for rifles sold, as we shall see. Ruger and Anschutz each have around 10% of the market of Field Sports Channel viewers, with a massive 39% of the market is CZ. And consider that CZ owns Bruno, which itself comes fourth. That gives CZ nearly half the market for rimfires. When it comes to rimfire ammunition, you are similarly polarised. Ely, Hornady and CCI each have between 15 and 20% of the market. The winner with 30% of all rimfire ammunition sold to Field Sports Channel viewers is Winchester. Let's have a look at individual rimfire rifle models and why you like them. The winner for both reliability and for value for money is the Anschutz 1417. The winner for fit, looks and for accuracy, in the opinion of our viewers, is the Sacco Finfire. When it comes to the most popular models, it's worth noting that you hang on to your rimfires. The average age of the rimfires you own is more than 12 years. Here are your top 5 favourite rifles. In number 5, it's the Browning T-Bolt. 
Number four goes to the Sacco Quad. The Ruger 1022 owns the number three slot. Number two is the CZ 452. And your rimfire of choice is the CZ455, which by itself outsells each of the other manufacturers' entire rimfire ranges, with 15% of the market on its own. Checkmate to our checkmates at CZ. Now, Chris Packham admitted last week there were probably only about 100 people involved in Raptor persecution. As a result, his campaign has taken a bit of a hit. News editor Ben O'Rourke looks at the numbers. There will soon be nothing left. I'm adamant that most of these people who are looking at the rewilding and these bird of prey release and I can see this countryside of ours being barren in my lifetime. You can't have the amount of avian predators that we have now and think that things are going to stay the same because they're not. Gary Baxter has worked with birds of prey for more than 40 years as a falconer and a gamekeeper. He understands there needs to be a balance in Britain's wildlife and both raptor persecution and in some cases reintroduction of birds of prey have no place in his book. When I was a boy, I used to mix with a lot of the old school gamekeepers and the rules then that these people lived under was hook, beak and claws and anything black for the sake of game preservation. But I proved that you don't need to persecute to do your shooting. You don't. Every morning, first light, same time as I fed the pheasants, I was feeding the kites and the buzzards. You do not need to persecute. Despite Gary's views reflecting those of most modern wildlife managers, the media are stepping up its assault on moorland gamekeepers, claiming frequently that satellite data proves they are killing raptors to protect grouse. Although shooters condemn raptor persecution and gamekeepers know they will lose their jobs and their gun licenses if they do it, people on both sides of the debate, who live on or near uplands in the north of England, agree the issue is not so clear cut. You'll see some of the tracker data is released, pointing at suspicious circumstances, yet the birds thrived and done well, and the trackers proved that. It's been in that area for many, many weeks. Just up the valley from here, we've got the, uh, the white-tailed eagle has been released from the Isle of Wight. There's two of them birds have been tracked and been up here since April. John trains dogs for driven grouse shoots and was a former senior wildlife manager at the Hawk and Owl Trust. Wilf Norman is a bird ringer and Chris Packham supporter. We featured both last week in a story about bird ringing. I think the RSPB are trying to get a population of white-tailed eagles established down in England. But as soon as the birds were released and able to fly, they took one look at the Isle of Wight and decided they didn't like it there. Headed up here and they've been, they've been in the area ever since. Last year there was a continental bird in the area and it's been seen again this year. So we've got three white-tailed eagles in the area, two with trackers on, one not on a grouse moor. If one of them was to disappear suddenly, there'd be questions pointed at uh, the shooting fraternity saying it's died on a grouse moor. They haven't said it's been living there for over a year. It's the fact that it's died there. The RSPB and Packham's pressure groups Revive and Wild Justice try to pin any raptor death on gamekeepers. But last week, Packham undermined his own arguments when he said he believes only a tiny number of gamekeepers persecute raptors. It could be as few as 100 people. Wilf, however, believes the newspaper reports. Yes, I'm afraid bird of prey uh, persecution is uh, it's, it's still rife. I mean, I, like, I get on with a lot of keepers. I get a lot of help from them. I like them. Uh, I like gamekeepers as blokes. I get, but as keepers, I don't like them at all. I don't like what they do. And I don't trust any of them, really, where the bigger birds of prey are concerned. But can you really, you can't really kind of muddy all gamekeepers? Just no, 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 of, no. I mean, there's a couple of bad apples. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's not a couple of bad apples. I'm sorry, it's not a couple of bad apples. It's the, they probably find the, the, the few are the good ones. So you think it's quite widespread? Oh, it's widespread, yeah. I have no doubt whatsoever about that. I think the facts prove it. You, you do any research on bird of prey persecution and you will, uh, 
you'll find I'm right. A lot of those supposed facts are from data that is flawed. The RSPB and others keep the statistics secret, then selectively release information when they feel it backs up their persecution of keepers and shooting estates. The media, which has only told half the story, is too lazy to fill in the missing pieces, such as why the data released ignores the 70% of raptors that die naturally before they are one year old. When we're putting electronic devices on birds, that's not coming out that we're finding a bird that's died naturally. If you think about it, it's 70% for every 10 tags we've put on, we should be finding two, three, up to seven birds that have died naturally. But for some reason, every single person that we see has the data for the tag. The bird has died in suspicious circumstances. How can that be? There's got to be more to it than, than what they're letting out. The fact that the data is only available to the person that's paid for the, 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 the tags that are going on them seems a bit silly, a bit, bit strange. If we're doing science, the science should be scrutinised by all parties. We should argue with it, they should defund them. It's like defunding the police, you know, the defund the conservation groups who don't make their data open access. Any funding, public funding that goes towards conservation research and to tagging programmes should have mandatory open data APIs of, of all the information. Because A, it's being funded by the public or being funded from the public purse. And if you want to have good science, you want to have citizen scientists who can also look at it. Otherwise, you get the RSPB thing where they just say, well, this is what the science says. Well, you can't question the science because it's proprietary data. But these satellite tags have proved that most birds of prey that are persecuted occur on grouse moors. You'll see quite often on the media, you'll see a bird found dead on a grouse moor. Well, it's found dead there because it lives there. It's like saying worm found dead in my garden. It's found dead there because it lives there. The GWCT would, could be a great body to almost lead on this sort of stuff because they've got such great established science. But the problem is established science is, is always reported on, as I said, on page 99, as you know. Mm. You know, when Chris Packham says one thing, which is complete bull, but it, it, it gets headlines everywhere. And then when it turns out not to be true, well, that's reported weeks later, you know, at the back of the newspaper. Chris Packham is our, our spokesman, uh, along with um, Ruth Tingey. They'll make sure that uh, <laughs> uh, the word gets out and it will keep getting out to more and more people. With social media now, um, more and more people in the general populace are getting aware of what goes on and they don't like it. So the pressure is going to get greater and greater on uh, moral, gross moor owners. Uh, on keepers, uh, and eventually, you know, conservationists, like I regard myself as one, we will, win when it, we will win out in the end. Are these really the tactics of people who claim to be conservationists? Cherry-picking data to frame gamekeepers and constant persecution online. Observers may interpret it more as obsessive behaviour bordering on extremism and slander. I met Gareth Doherty from Basque in Rosedale on the North York Moors at the start of a charity walk. I suppose it's become more and more awareness in the media of, of groups or sections of society being singled out and then persecuted for, for, for other people not, not liking their beliefs, I suppose. So, uh, yes, I think, I think that's, that's happening more and more. And um, the, the, the recent acknowledgement of Chris Packham um, about you know, what, what he believes, if you look at the raptor persecution side of things, is being a tiny, tiny minority of the, of the, uh, of the gamekeeper population, but yet gamekeepers are branded. Um, and, and I think it's, a, it's almost like a cartoon branding. It's gamekeepers are bad people, they're nasty people. Uh, they're predominantly usually men in this cartoon character. You don't speak to them. They're not part of society. They're almost somebody that lurks in the shadows and isn't part of the community. There is a perception that gamekeepers are always doing things that they shouldn't be and they're constantly being monitored. And that goes right down to the family and to the children, to even to the extent where the children are told not to say that they are the children of gamekeepers, which is ridiculous, isn't it? You know, it's totally, totally wrong. The first real conservationists in this country were gamekeepers. Not only were they preserving the game stocks, but in the middle of winter they were feeding the songbirds. Without them, this country is gone.
Thank you, Ben. Now from gamekeeping to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Except for this film. Mountain Goat, who has been there, recommends this gorgeous film about deer on the Scottish island of Jura by filmmaker Ewan Miles. It's on Vimeo, not YouTube, so I have put the link separately into the description below. Back to YouTube and Henry Darling recently shot a video of pigeon shooting with some long birds and his hide spikes. Henry's hide spikes, which we have featured on Field Sports Britain. Yanni Salmi is on an early season goose day in Finland. And and in Finnish, it's a 12 minute film about the setup, the decoying, and the shooting. Row in the rut in Poland in this film, a hunter called Gernot Lengert is out with Cord Dreyer from the Carla Hunting Agency. The film is sponsored by a German insurance company. Thanks to viewer Tianen, who sends me this hunting film from J.E. Wilde's Red Stags on the beautiful west coast of New Zealand's South Island. And there's a part two of this video out too. On the east coast, Josh James Kiwi Bushman is out after tar. It's a half hour film covering a three day camp. Camp. Staying in New Zealand, Wild NZ Outdoors is out in the cold on North Otago after red stags before they drop their antlers. It's down to minus 12. And finally, a hunt point retrieve trial from Spain, the Campeones de San Huberto. I thought it might be interesting for British test and trialers to see how the Spaniards do it. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the I symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so, please whiz over to our website. You'll find a link there to our Field Sports Nation page. There you can help us produce films like the Replica Persecution, Gamekeeper Persecution film that Ben did this week. You can also click to like us on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube. And of course, you can pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show. Field Sports Britain is at 7 p.m. UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting. Good fishing and goodbye.